A brief announcement and a word of clarification. The author will not be reading from 26 gasoline stations. <laughs> Good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Steve Ennis and I'm director of the Harry Ransom Center. My colleagues and I are delighted to present this conversation with Ed Ruscha about the making of books, which for more than 50 years has been an important complement to his larger format paintings, drawings, and prints. Artist, author, they merge in the case of Ed Ruscha, quite possibly our most book and text conscious of visual artist. I hope many of you have had a chance to view or will in the coming weeks the Ransom Center's current exhibition, Ed Ruscha, Archaeology and Romance, curated by Dr. Jessica McDonald, the Center's Nancy Inman and Marlene Nathan Meyerson, curator of photography. This is the first exhibition drawn from the Ed Ruscha papers, which were acquired by the university in 2013. The exhibition examines Ruscha's highly original artist books, which have, since the 1960s, been an important vehicle for his creative engagement with his surroundings, whether it be the roadways of the American West or the commercial storefronts and parking lots of the Los Angeles cityscape. We are grateful to the Gagosian Gallery for its generous sponsorship of this exhibition. The Ed Ruscha Papers and Art Collection contains production materials for Ed Ruscha's highly influential artist books and other commission projects, including photographs, drawings, prints, notebooks that reveal his working methods and the creative choices the artist made. The Ransom Center is committed to documenting the creative process in literature, theater, film, photography, and art. And it's a special pl pleasure to welcome Ed back to the university for this evening's conversation. I would draw your attention um, to an upcoming event on October 11th, when the Ransom Center will have a screening of three of Ed Ruscha's short films. Details of this and other related programs can be found on the center's website. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jessica McDonald. Jessica holds a PhD in visual and cultural studies from the University of Rochester. She formerly held curatorial positions at the San Francisco Museum of Art and the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. She is the editor of Nathan Lyons, Selected Essays, Lectures, and Interviews, and editor and contributor to Elliot Erwitt, Home Around the World, published by the Ransom Center and Aperture in 2016. She has curated numerous Ransom Center exhibitions and a recent exhibition on Ralph Eugene Meat Yard for the Blanton Museum of Art. She is a gifted and talented curator and her latest contribution to the university community and to us all is Ed Ruscha, Archaeology and Romance. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thanks, Steve. Welcome, everyone. It's a big night. It's good to see so many familiar faces. It's my pleasure to introduce our special guest tonight, Ed Ruscha. And we've all been looking forward to this event for a really long time, so I'll make these remarks brief so we can get to the conversation. One of the most influential artists of our time, Ed Ruscha has created groundbreaking works in a variety of media, including painting, prints, drawings, artist books, and photographs. He's internationally renowned for works that synthesize words and images, and for deadpan renderings of the roadside landscapes commercial signs, and vernacular architecture of Los Angeles and the American West. It's been an honor to work with him in preparation for the exhibition, and it's a real treat to welcome him to the stage now for this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Ed Ruscha. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Well, are we having 
Is that me so, or you? Are we good here? Okay, great. All yeah, right. you know, I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude to you, Jessica, for this exhibit and the way you install this exhibit. And it's one of the best I've seen of my work like this. And, uh, and I want to thank everyone from the, uh, the preparators and anyone who, Steve Ennis and everybody who participated in this exhibit. That means a lot to me and to all of us. Thank you. I can go home now, right? <laughs> Thank you. That's, I'll pass that along for anyone who's not here, but that's really, I have to tell you, it was a relief um, to hear some of that earlier today when you first saw the exhibition. It's really great. Okay, so, ready to have a little conversation? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. You, you started off. Okay. So. I will. All right. So let me tell you a little bit about the collection here and the one that is uh, featured in our exhibition at the Ransom Center now. Um, it's really a carefully organized subset of your total archive and you really shaped it for us around this idea of your artist books and libraries. And we'll be talking tonight mostly about books and on the photographs that you made for them. And I wanna start by thinking about um, something you told the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark last year. You, you uh, were interviewed for a video that was made in advance of their exhibition of your work this year. And in that video you said, quote, everything I do comes from the way I was when I was 16 or 17 years old. It seems to be like a variation on a theme. And in large part, our exhibition is organized around that idea, the idea of variations on a theme. And it looks at some of the ways that you've returned to certain themes again and again in your work. And it, if this is all rooted in the interests you had in your teenage years, then maybe we should start there. The Ransom Center has acquired your high school yearbook from 1956. <laughs> this is my newest acquisition. Um, hasn't no. even been cataloged yet. And this is the year that you graduated. Here you are in the National Art Honor Society. Here you are winning an award in the National Printing Contest. Here you are in a club called Art Nouveau with the slogan, Where There's Art. Can you back that up? We've just had a, a part. I'd love to. That one. So now at the bottom there, uh -huh. I'm, there I am. And on the two people over, that's Jack Taylor. He was a very good friend of mine. And he figured into the breaking of this Karen Silkwood plutonium McCur McGee uh, scandal that happened years huh? ago. And he was a reporter for the Colorado newspaper. Uh, just thought I'd answer. Yeah. <laughs> interesting characters here. <laughs> <laughs> it's full of people here, and I'm trying to pull out this one lady who was uh, a cheerleader and her father pitched for the New York Yankees, Allie Reynolds, but I can't find her there, so. I think she's in the second row, second from the left. Maybe so, <laughs> might, have, might be, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I have to say that you are not present in any other activities in this yearbook. It's all the art clubs. So it seems that indeed where there was art, you had a part. Could you tell us a little bit about how your interest in art developed during these years? You've said that everything comes back to this time. So what are some of the themes in your work that you've made since then that we can sort of trace back to then? Mm, and you said 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. I would change that to 18. Okay, we're changing it to 18. Age 18. That's okay. why I, I uh, seem to go back to that, saying that everything that was formed in me happened about that time. And then everything that I've done since actually derives back to that, that age. Mm -hmm. So what I are some of those interests you had when you were 18 that, that we can I see. Maybe you should go forward here. In, in the pictures, and um, I, um, I remember working for uh, an industrial supply company in Oklahoma City where they said, go to the library and go through every 
phone book in the state of Oklahoma and write down every lumber company that is in the state of Oklahoma. And I did that, and there were hundreds and hundreds of them. And um, I'm not sure that I, my end product was that productive to them. But it was to me because I began to notice other things in the library, like art books and things that I, and we didn't really have a, we did have a museum, but it wasn't uh, very advanced, and we didn't see too many original artworks. I saw mostly things in books, so going to the library seemed to help me out. Okay. <laughs> what other books from your youth may have influenced some of the books that perhaps you have created since then? I always liked these little cartoon books called Big Little Books. And uh, I think maybe you even have a picture of them here. Yeah. And uh, I collected these books. It was uh, part of a uh, kid's activity. And uh, they became, to me, they were like thick, like this thick. And um, so they were pieces of sculpture. They were more, more than just books. They were little, little blocks, well, almost like a brick. And I liked them for that. And uh, they had a good way of telling a story, the cartoon story that happened. And most of them were about crime and punishment and radio patrol, all that kind of stuff like that. So that um, um, introduced me to another side of things. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be a direct result of that. Interest. That was a book that I did for a, a Minneapolis Institute of the Arts exhibit of my work and it was I made sure this was printed by the same people that did those big little books they were still in business so this was a one of those big little books made the same size and same width and height and everything so that's how that came to be. And I think there are 200 blank pages at the back or something like that to make sure you reach the thickness that you desire. Maybe so, so. I think so. You're right. <laughs> I had to have that thickness. Right, yeah. right. I skipped a couple slides and what I want to make sure we talk about are these Monroe Leaf books, which you've mentioned a number of times, were sort of uh, children's books that you, that have emerged in your brain as something that may have influenced um, some ideas. Can you talk a little bit about that? Now these are books that I don't know you saw, but they're examples uh, that are sort of um, characteristic of the books. Yeah, in school they were always pushing, us, pushing these books at us, and I liked the name Monroe Leaf. I mean, it just had a ring to it. And also, the material in the books, as you can, I hope you can read up there, is so simplistic. It's like stupefyingly simplistic. And I, I guess I liked it for that reason. That Maybe I can learn something after all. <laughs> well, in digging around, these books also have sort of a dark side. So this is the favorite one I found. Listen, little girl, before you come to New York. Yeah, not sure I ran across this example. Right. But uh, he made many books, I think. I like how the, there's sort of a, a main title on the cover and then the reveal when you get to the title page, much like some of your books. Yes, and they're probably collector's items today. I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to continue talking a little bit about the years immediately before you made your first book, 26 Gasoline Stations, which was published in 1963. You moved to Los Angeles in 1956 for art school, and you've said that moving there from Oklahoma City... 56. What did I say? 66? 56. 56, yeah. Mm -hmm. You've said that moving there from Oklahoma City was like moving to a different planet. Can you talk about that a little bit? What about Los Angeles made it seem like a different planet to you in 1956? Well, palm trees, there you go, palm trees. Um, and uh, so the vegetation and the fact that uh, everything was on a single story kind of thing. I dreamed about going to New York and I knew there were art schools there. There was one in LA too, there was one in Kansas City and Chicago and so I picked L.A. because I had visited there before, and I felt like uh, this is a very swank culture that I that I've just magnetized towards. So I was I headed that way. Okay. When 
you went to art school, you had to buy a camera for a class. So in 1956, this is the camera that you purchased. This is in our exhibition now. Um, and presumably, you traveled back and forth between Oklahoma City and Los Angeles during those years, between 1956 and 1960 when you were in art school. Yet at this point, you weren't yet using photography in a comprehensive way as you did later for your books. So I'm curious a little bit about timing. Um, the earliest photographs I know of that you made um, in which you really seem to be exploring outside the studio weren't made until you went to Europe in 1961. And you were there um, first with your mother and your brother and later traveling alone. And when you arrived as a family, your mother purchased this car. And so um, it, it sort of struck me that you photograph Europe largely by car. A lot of times people will travel between major cities on the train and then they'll sort of explore a city on foot. Um, but you, even in Europe, were photographing from inside or next to or near a car and exploring Europe that way. Um, yeah, and uh, notice that uh, and the camera, by the way, took a fall. It went to the floor, and uh, I didn't, I th it looked all right to me, but I kept using it. And if you notice, the right-hand side of that has a real sizable light leak. And um, I kind of let it be, and I tried to cover up. I put tape on it, did everything else to stop these light leaks. But it began to actually like the light leaks. So, and it sort of worked its way into some of my later things that I was interested in. So, but the car was, uh, I was already aware of um, photography. I mean, I, I got sort of initiated into the world through the work of Walker Evans and also Robert Frank. Uh, his, that book that he produced, which was a, a dynamite book, uh, The Americans, was published about 1958 or so, and uh, I had never seen anything like that in human interest photography. And, and it was really, he titled that book, The Americans, and it really captured America like no other Americans had been able to do before. And I think it was because he was not from America, he was from Switzerland. So he came and so he saw it was a very, with a very pure vision. And uh, I don't know, I think a lot of my pictures were probably influenced by him, but um, so I, I uh, knew a little bit about the world of uh, photography through these particular guys. I'm glad you brought up Robert Frank because you're anticipating a question. So as we get there, um, I want to look at a few examples of photographs you made in Europe because I think they really become distinctive. This one looks like sort of the street photography of that era, which is what I would expect. Um, but since you're traveling by car, this is actually really anomalous. Your photographs start to look very different from sort of the street photographs that are characteristic of this period. Here we see you moving away a little bit. And here, this doesn't look anything like the street photographs. It really, we're moving into sort of road photography instead of street photography, even as you move through Europe, if I can call it road photography. Um, and since then, you, quite recently, you've told at least one interviewer that, quote, seeing things from a car is the greatest. So I do want to get to Robert Frank, but how was your experience in Europe shaped by seeing it from the car, do you think? And why do you think seeing a place from a car is so great? First of all, I was able to move along and I would, didn't have to get out of the car. It saved a lot of time. Practical. <laughs> I just opened this little flap that was in the car, this piece of glass that came down halfway, and I was able to photograph out, look at that. out of the car. But a lot of my pictures were taken on the street. I was standing here on the street, standing here. And um, so I think this is like, Brussels, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> but I just took things, I didn't pose pictures, I didn't uh, study setups, I, I, I more or less snapped the pictures. Sort of like 
you know, a whippersnapper. <laughs> you know, take the picture and that's it. And so mostly I didn't take three or four um, insurance pictures. Right. I would just take one picture and then walk away because that was enough for me. This photograph is really interesting. Um, we've got the subject isolated in the center. We've got the frame divided pretty symmetrically in halves. Uh, there's this great expanse of road sort of in the foreground. Um, there's a sense of distance. It seems that there's kind of a standing back, not a jumping in. And, and as we talk tonight, I think we'll see that this sort of established an interesting baseline for some of the photographs that appear in the, in the books you made. That's New York. Yes, yes. So you so. come back to New York after Europe, and it, it looks to me like the photographs I've seen of, of those that you made when you returned stay in this sort of pattern that you established when you were there, which is, I think, pretty unusual for this time. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, good and bad photographs in a, in, a, in a moment, and I think that that'll come up as quite important. But these are very, people weren't making photographs like this. They were taught not to make photographs like this. Um, and here we are with a gas station, which is quite interesting. And then when you head back toward Los Angeles, you go there in the same car that you bought in Europe. You had it shipped back over, so you've got the same car and the same camera, and you're, you start making the photographs that ultimately we would see um, in 26 gasoline stations. So within a year, you're making <laughs> photographs like this, and here we see your light leak a little bit. But again, those same characteristics. Albuquerque. OK. So I'd like to allude, let's go back to Robert Frank here. So um, you're exactly right. The Americans was published in France in 58, the United States in 59. So this is just two years before you are in Europe. And you've, as you've said, it really made a strong impression on you. But you realize that it really took somebody European to see America in that way. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you experienced something like that in Europe, seeing Europe as an American, but maybe more pertinent to this conversation, if you saw things in a different way when you returned to the United States. So perhaps there were things that you hadn't noticed when, before you went to Europe, but that distance and then that return made you look at things in a different way, maybe as characteristically American. So maybe gas stations became sort of characteristically American to you in a way that you had never noticed before. Uh, you, you're on to something there. Um, <laughs> Good, tell uh, me more. I mean, I saw curiosities wherever I did in Europe, and I was there for about eight months. And, uh, but then towards the end, I couldn't wait to get back to the USA. And um, I knew, I mean, I just felt like that's where the energy is. And I felt uh, really dramatically pulled back to, to America. and I just felt like, well, I don't have to go back to Europe for a while, but um, so I don't, and I didn't really get that much inspiration from museums at that time, much more today than back then, but I really wanted to get back to America and especially the Western US. Okay. So how did it all come together into this book at a time when this wasn't really uh, an established category? Um, I, I was taking pictures uh, on subsequent trips across uh, between Oklahoma and California, and uh, um, there's something lonely about gas stations that I liked, and they really stuck out. And you needed them. You had to stop and buy gasoline, and so it made a kind of an easy target for exploring this whole subject. And um, I began to gather a collection of these pictures, and uh, and then um, at the same time I had thought about making books before because I studied printing and I I learned how to set type and I worked for a printer and and uh, worked on books and um, so I, I had this great urge to make a book and I felt like hey this is it I mean I'm going to do it with this. And I kind of almost knew the title of it before I even got to put it, put the book together. And I even had to ask myself, 
why 26? And I never really got an answer to that. <laughs> uh, you know, I do remember, I, and this is not, I mean, I hitchhiked to, from Oklahoma to Miami with a friend, and, uh, and this was like in the early 50s, and it, I distinctly remember it taking 26 rides to get down there, and it took 26 rides to get back. But I think there was a disconnect or something, I forgot about that, and here 26 comes up again, so maybe there's some cosmic answer to that. Okay. Well, here's a spread from that book. And reviews were mixed. People were confused, probably much to your delight. In 1963, Art Forum editor Philip Leder famously described this book as so curious and so doomed to oblivion that there is an obligation of sorts to document its existence. <laughs> He also wrote, and this is something that caught my eye and isn't as frequently um, quoted, the photographs are not professional. Most of them are not even good. <laughs> now, this was intentional. Compliments. <laughs> and I want to talk about this idea of intentionally bad photographs. Um, now, in 2012, The Guardian asked you to submit your worst photograph. They have this running series uh, about the best photograph, but then they sort of flipped it one time and asked artists to submit their worst. And you provided this one. Now this was taken just next to one of the same gas stations that appears in the book, but this is sort of an outtake. You spent a little time um, hanging out. Um, and you can see that this is near the Texaco Jackrabbit, Arizona photograph. And you can see the little jackrabbits sort of hopping yeah. on the Wooden fence there. Wooden jackrabbits, yes. Right. So what are the elements of this photograph that make it unsuccessful in your view? Uh, I was, um, I wanted to find um, an example of something that was um, interesting. And um, I was taught in school that uh, symmetrical things were not interesting. And so something that was placed to the side of a picture, like this car here, <clears throat> made this more interesting and I did not want something interesting so that's why I call this a bad photograph. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And so. I took it. <laughs> I in intentionally took a bad photograph. <laughs> so the things that you were taught made a good photograph made it bad for you and likewise the things that were sort of assumed to make a bad photograph are things that you tried to do. Right? So that's where we get things like this. So if symmetry is bad, this is pretty bad. We've got the horizon bifurcating the, the photograph. Another sort of rule of thumb is don't put your subject right in the center, but all of your photographs, the subject is right mm. in the center. Um, you don't follow the rule of thirds, which is that sort of thing you were talking about with the car off to the side. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about um, those choices you were making. And one of the really interesting things about the collection here at the Ransom Center is that we have uh, this little photograph, which um, I think is a testament to sort of what you were doing in 1962. It looks like you brought it to just the photo mat and had them print up. I did, little, yeah. These are similar to the, you know, just any snapshot. Um, and, but we've got a variant as well. So this is the photograph that ultimately made it into the book. And then we've got this one, too, which did not make it into the book. And if we look at them both, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about why you chose the first one and not the second one. It gives us a tiny window into your editing process. Because usually, as you said, you would just sort of take one and move on. But here we've got a couple of them. OK, I think one of these pictures was the victim of subjective choice and uh, so that means uh, explanations not included <laughs> no, um, but I did these pictures are so close to one another but I felt like let's see maybe I, I did choose the one on the left is that right did no. I no, I chose the one on the right, yeah. yeah. Maybe I didn't like that car there or something. Uh -huh. It looked too, uh, 
mobile or something. And so I wanted something a little drier. And, um, but I also had a soft spot for this location, which was called Jackrabbit, Arizona. And I always remember traveling across country and anywhere between Chicago and LA, along the way, every four or 500 miles, you'd see a giant wooden statue of uh, Jackrabbit. And it would say, 750 miles, <laughs> and then 500 Strong miles. Strong marketing campaign. Yeah. yeah, and I don't think any of these exist today because the highways are also, also different, but uh, I believe that Jackrabbit, Arizona is still Jackrabbit, Arizona, and they sell Navajo blankets. You can see some of them on the front of the building there. Yes. There's um, books in the book. And so it had a particular, saw, I had a soft spot for that jackrabbit silhouette. All right, let's talk a little bit more about reception. So this is what the book looks like. We know, we've heard what Philip Leader said. Um, this is sort of a funny thing from the archive. Even the printer wasn't quite sure what to call this book. The term artist book wasn't really circulating yet, and so this was charging you for photo, 400 photo album booklets. I like that description. I do too. Booklets. I do too. Yeah. Not sure what it means, but I think that's kind of the point. They must have had a discussion about this. What do we call this thing? Let's don't uh, insult our artist. Right, <laughs> right, right. It seems very deliberate yet confused. Um, we know what Art Forum said, and then you get this response from the Library of Congress. So you submit your copy of your publication for registration at the Library of Congress. They send it back, no thanks. Um, and you still feel for pretty strongly about this. It's sort of a mystery that ha that's still hanging there. We're not sure why this happened. I, can't, I had 400 copies of this book, and I didn't really know what to do with them, but I, I did pass them out to people. And some people would say, like if I gave it to somebody who worked in a gas station, they'd you'd be very interested in it. If you gave it to a poet or an intellectual, <clears throat> they're almost insulted by it. <laughs> they were. Are you putting me on or what? And so I felt like I wanted to make it, I wanted some legitimacy to it. So I guess I heard that there was this sacrosanct place in Washington called the Library of Congress. And maybe this book could be part of that Library of Congress. And so I sent them the book, and I could get this back. And so I, uh, it was like I felt like this was a badge of honor. And I don't think they do this today, by the way. I think that anything that you make and send to the Library of Congress, they're obliged to catalog and keep it, I think, even if it's pornography. I, 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 think, I think that's true. I don't know. Somebody can research that. <laughs> Someone in this audience surely yeah. knows. Well, you sort of made that into an opportunity here, uh, publishing an ad for the book, <laughs> marketing it on the fact that it was rejected by this sacrosanct institution. Now it's yeah. some kind of contraband rejected by the government, um, which is, is, I think, a strong uh, play on your part. And, I think something that's really interesting that comes out of the archive is that is something like this. So despite all of this reaction, you write up your specs for your second book and you want it to be exactly like the first one. <laughs> Which I, when I found this document, yeah. I thought, okay, excellent. And it becomes uh, exactly like the first one. So what was that about? What was the determination to sort of keep did you already uh, envision an entire series and so you were just going to continue? Or w was the uh, mixed reaction more of a motivation for you that you had hit this point that you were right where you wanted to be and you wanted to keep going? Well, I was watching uh, what was happening in the world of art and um, like I liked uh, the abstract expressionist painters and uh, I might think something like Franz Klein did these very black on white brushy paintings and. He would do one, then he would do another one. And then, and then I said, well that, now you have a thing. 
Franz Klein, you have a thing. And so maybe that's what I was thinking here, is that um, once I got going on this, I didn't want to abandon w w this uh, little rock I looked under. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had to just keep making them. Okay, all right. We're gonna come back to that <laughs> need in a moment. Um, I want to think a little bit about the reception from artists because after this second book, other artists started responding by making their own books. This is a book, once it folds up, it goes in between that cover. This is Bruce Nauman's Burning Small Fires in which he tears out every page with a fire in your book, burns it and photographs it and makes this book. Um, since then, we've had uh, almost 100 that I know of or that I think have been uh, documented, but there are probably more um, titles that have sort of riffed. One of my favorites is None of the Buildings on the Sunset Strip. We also have uh, kind of direct uh, uh, copies, I guess there's probably a better word, but you, you, your royal road test was made as sort of documentation, almost like a crime scene of when a typewriter was thrown out of a moving car and smashed everywhere, and Macintosh road test is a technological update to that using a, a, a Mac. We also have sort of a one-for-one -one reenactment of hard light here that uh, was uh, this was a book that I did with uh, Lawrence Wiener in like 1978 and uh, somehow we got together with cameras and girls and we had a car involved in it and we were making this kind of uh, vague narrative thing going on and produced the book and then it kind of sat for 30 years or so and then one day someone sends me a book, this one on the right, and uh, I see, you know, the the credits on it, places this thing being made in some obscure town in Russia. Mm -hmm. And um, I never, it, it, uh, somebody sent it to me and I don't know where it ever came from. And then I sent one, uh, I managed to get another copy of it and sent one to Lawrence. He said, I've never seen it. I've, I've never seen this. It's a total surprise to me. So, and the, the girls that made this book didn't notify us or anything. So it's just, I have no idea what their story is and they probably don't know what mine was. Is that typical <laughs> of the experience of, of this whole, there seems to be this whole community of artists out there over the last <clears throat> 50 years who have made books that acknowledge your books, uh, maybe they're an homage or just some kind of extrapolation. Has it been mostly your experience that you just they emerge and somebody draws your attention to them, or are you contacted by people, uh, the artists making them, or is this all just sort of a, uh, it's happening out there in the ether and, and you sometimes see one? I um, receive these by, almost by accident, and <coughs> to my surprise too. And like there was another one, the most recent one was the Royal Road Test, which I thought somebody was sending my, sending me my own book. <laughs> and I opened it up and didn't know this is from Japan. And uh, it's about uh, some guys in Japan who threw a, uh, a computer out of a window and made that story out of it. So the world's fu full of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the Goshen Gallery uh, in 2013, uh, Bob Monk is here, right? Um, organized this exhibition, Edward Shea Books and Company, with titles of books that are made um, around your books. This is just part of an installation when it traveled to the gallery in Paris. Um, and I'm delighted to say that 64 of these books uh, were just donated to the Ransom Center by Gagosian, so they'll be available to be studied alongside your books. And we're really thrilled about that. That also just happened. So that and the yearbook, it's all happening. <laughs> we're, we're building on, we're adding, okay. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the more less direct uh, things that we can learn from your archive in terms of reception. So you kept documents related to certain projects in folders, and those came to the Ransom Center, and we have them. And um, as I've been looking through them, some things really um, stand out. Uh, 
And one of the most revealing sets of folders was uh, the folders around 34 parking lots. And it really shows how there was uh, interesting reception from different quarters. So we had architects and architectural theorists and architectural historians really um, finding your work to be important. So this is um, Denise Scott Brown, 1969. Rainer Banham, of course, included a number of your photographs um, in his publications. Uh, you can you back that up sure, just a second? Sure. Now, this, this picture right here, um, someone even made a, was making a study on the oil, on oil consumption. And um, as you can see, this parking lot has oil spots. And the curious thing about it is, is that the, at the top of the picture is the store. And I believe it's a Sears, some kind of Sears department store there. And as you can see, the farther you get away from the store itself, the less oil spots you see. I mean, they diminish all the way down to almost nothing. And somebody made uh, an actual study of that. Now, this person is doing, doing something else. I don't know. And then, just a year later, this is a folder, I'm sorry, a poster that folds up into four and was part of an edition of um, Aspen, Magazine in a Box, the special issue edited by Dan Graham. So this is an artist publication filled with, it's sort of, it's a periodical, but it's not really a magazine. It's a box filled with uh, anything those artists want to put in there. So sometimes it's a musical recording or a poster or a pamphlet or leaflet. Um, and you contributed this poster. So we've got this parking lot here. Um, now, 14 years later, there's a whole different community that's starting to include you in their history. So photo history here. We've got Abbeville Press publishing Naomi Rosenblum's The History of Photography, or The World History of Photography, and you submitted this photograph. Clearly, you weren't yet, uh, not everyone was quite uh, familiar with your work yet. The, the sort of joke here is that when it was sent back to you, the person typing this letter must have thought that you worked for the State Board of Equalization, because that's what came after your name and then just whited out. Um, so there wasn't real clarity there. Um, and then we get your photograph used without irony on the cover of a park lighting for parking lots. Um, it's sort of an industrial yeah. brochure. So within this yeah. 15 years, we've got, you know, artist publications. We've got a parking lighting brochure. We've got um, an art historical approach, a photo historical approach. We've got all these different kinds of things. And all of these documents are just in an unassuming folder in your archive across the way. And so you can kind of look through all of these things and see mm -hmm that your work was successful, I think, uh, in, in not thinning in anywhere on purpose, <laughs> which was something that I would imagine was That's why I saved all these satisfying things. to you. Yes, yeah. good, I'm, glad, I'm so glad you did. And now we can, we can um, exhibit them. Now, um, if we look at this and then think about this interview you did 20 years before, um, this is this, uh, earliest kind of published interview with you, John Copeland's interviewed you for Art Forum about your perplexing publications. Again, people weren't really sure how to categorize your artist books. And you said that your photographs are technical data, like industrial photography. So this really seems like the kind of desired outcome um, 20, 20 years later. Did that really, do you, you said that's why you saved all of these things, but were, was there some kind of satisfaction in this ultimately being used in an industrial publication? Yes, and uh, I felt like it, if if they want to cover something like this in an in an art publication, that's fine too. In, in which this was, I believe, in the Art Forum magazine, mm -hmm. and um, but any time the issue was spread out and, the, and people saw different things into it that were not art related, that was also a compliment to whatever I was doing. I think that is loud and clear in the, in the archive. Great, okay. I wanna keep talking a little bit about facts and information um, and I wanna just bring out a few things that we can see um, through your book, A Few Palm Trees in 1971. 
a real testament to your sort of commitment to the facts is this book. We get on the first spread this, this statement, camera facing west on all photos. Well, the backgrounds are stripped out of all of them, so no one would have ever really known if you were facing west or not. There was no real, you wouldn't have been caught had you just put in palm trees, whether they were facing north, south, east, or west. Um, and many years later, a series of three of these photographs came back. This is the same tree, but now we get to see where mm -hmm. you were. And if you were so inclined, as I am, you could go on Google Street View, <laughs> and way in the back you can see that, and this is a little blurry, but you can see the building there. If we go back, I believe that, same, that giant tall tree is your tree. It's in the same spot anyway, in the mm. sidewalk there. Um, but I'll tell you, every palm tree in that book is facing west. So you didn't have to do that. I didn't have to do that. There was no riddle to it, and there was no prank to it. I wasn't going to fool anybody, so I thought, I better follow this thing as I say, and that the camera must face west with all photographs. Did you often set parameters for, for your books? Well, yeah, and then that makes it easy to follow, and I don't have to ask myself, is this, is this right or wrong? Well, and we've talked a little bit about this before, and what you have brought up is this piece by Gordon Mata Clark, and I'm wondering if you could talk about this a bit. Why is this something that you feel an affinity with in terms of your palm trees book? Well, I knew the work of Gordon Mata Clark, and, but I didn't know this work, and I saw this in um, a publication somewhere, and it, it has a series, it shows a series of little shapes things here, each one of these shapes represents something. They're all in uh, scale to one another, so that that long horizontal line, about four or five things down, that is a, represents a piece of real estate in New York that is about four inches wide and 150 feet long. So he bought these properties, and he called them odd lots. <laughs> And I immediately connected with this, with his message here. And I never got to speak to him or anything. I only met him once. And, but he would buy these properties. And of course, he might spend $50 for one of these odd-shaped parcels. Um, someone could say, well, this is a, a wise investment. Or they could say, this is a wise crack. <laughs> So what costs $50 or something might have, you've got property taxes on that. So they might be like 39 cents a year. <laughs> and also in the future, one of these parcels could be very crucial to the development of some real estate venture. And as, as odd as these little lots are here, um, they still are what they are, and I believe over time he maybe lost interest in this activity that he was into. Not unlike my books, really, but I think he really forgot to pay his taxes. <laughs> and they eventually just took all of these properties away from him. So I believe that's the end of the story. <laughs> But a very noble cause, I think. I mean, it was. Mm -hmm. And a real fidelity to the facts, because the, the yes. sort of visual outcome could have happened without actually attending all of those options and purchasing all of those different. Yeah, and also it's yeah. a wake up call to the possibility that the, right outside this auditorium there might be some parcel that nobody knows about that's under the Mexican land grant or something that is, is crucial to the uh, changing of this property. and. You know, it just, it wakes people up to what's happening. <laughs> okay. I did not expect that last part. We'll have to investigate that. Okay. Um, another lesson of this archive, I think I alluded to earlier, is that you were always working on an impossible number of projects at once. And I'm going to just flip through a number of these so, so everyone gets a sense, and, the, and we'll, there will be question about this at the end, which will probably be obvious by the time I get there, but this is um, an early 
title for a few palm trees, uh, an early working title when you were thinking of calling it 17 Hollywood palm trees. But the interesting thing here is that you were working on real estate opportunities at the same time. Here we have a document uh, which is part of just some notes for um, some Los Angeles apartments. But at the bottom, you've got all these other possible book titles. Some of them I think you should still try to do. Um, but the one on the left in the bottom is, is almost exactly uh, the title of Nine Swimming Pools and a Broken Glass, which was published three years later, so that was sort of incubating for three years. I also want to think about, you know, you were working as an artist, but you also had to earn a living in the early days, so you're doing things like, um, here's a little catalog called Sunset House. I found a copy at the Minnesota History Center that a nun had donated. It's the only copy I could find. Um, but you were painting names on holiday gifts. You didn't do these, but these are similar, uh, this kind of thing. You were a sign painter for a while. This is a great photo of you. You were the art director for Art Forum for a while, and, and this is a cover you actually designed at the time. So you're doing these sort of commercial uh, projects, sometimes under a different name, Eddie Russia. Um, but I think that in some ways, some of the sort of techniques come back around into your work, and I'm thinking about this book, um, and something that popped out to me in the papers is um, the way that this is your first color book and you printed it instead of with four color separations, three with no black. And I had been looking at this book, I had been sort of obsessively looking at this book and wondering at why, why it looked so uh, sun bleached and bright and a little eerie like when you go outside and you can't really see anything. And then I thought, oh, well, he didn't print the black layer. And he only saved $1.50. <laughs> because he saved the price list. Obviously economic. Well, <laughs> so I just thought that was uh, brilliant in aesthetically and in the idea, because we get pictures like this, um, which give the book a whole different uh, a look that I really find compelling. and. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll tell us if that was really an economic decision or a... Uh, you know, I think that they, uh, the printer explained to me that uh, you could make a color photograph using three colors. You don't need a black plate. And so I thought, well, let's see what that looks like. And uh, they juiced these various three colors in such a way to produce something that almost looks black, but there's no black in there. So. Um, I think maybe I, my eyes lit up when I could say that $1.50, but <laughs> that, that it was the technique of this thing, making color pictures where you don't need four colors in the process. Now, I'm probably talking about something that's ancient now because most of this printing technique is way gone and uh, I would have type proofs made up and that's why we saw some of those earlier things with the various words uh, set in type. And um, today they're all computer driven and it's not, it's not even an issue, but it was back then. And, um, but this, this book was, a, I found to be um, a little different than all the rest of them. It is, it is, it has a very different look. I'm not sure it was just we can, we can all vote later. Okay. Um, I want to quickly, we need to, we need to move, but I want to quickly just do uh, sort of where this all comes together, where we can look at, and just two different spreads. So we have this notebook, and here's a spread about palm trees, here's another. If we go back to the first one, we see on the left where you're sort of moving closer in to something, and this is something that we don't see in a few palm trees, but we do see it in Dutch detail. So again, it's an idea that you sort of let simmer for another project. Then in this spread, we have all kinds of things happening. Um, we've got notes for a few palm trees, but on the right, we've got baby cakes, which turns into a book. We've got all of this list of words that turns into tanks, banks, ranks, thanks. And if we go back up on the you can see there on the right. Um, let me go back here. So if, if I could just ask you, if there's even a way to articulate it, how do you know when something's ready to rise to the top and be activated after maybe it was in a notebook from three years ago? Or sort of how does this work when you've got an impossible number of ideas and projects all sort of 
happening at the same time, and you have to remarkably produce many of them. Well, as I say, everything goes back to when I was 18 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how. Uh, these are like laundry lists. Th these things I do every day, and um, somehow they become um, little reminders or suggestors to me, and uh, that's the way they fall into place. And it's not, there's no logical steps to take to reach an end result. Sometimes they just tumble across one another, and as people out here in the audience know who write songs, that's the way it happens. And uh, things are kind of fall out of cycle and back into cycle. And so all of these thoughts and words that, that I put down uh, eventually make their way into something. And, um, and by the time they're done, I forget about them. And then I wonder, well, what's next? And you have so many things just in the pipeline. Okay. I think the archive also tells us a little bit about how you work and how you're able to get all of this done. And we're, we're nearing, we need to uh, move through the last section. So I'm going to go through and sort of narrate a number of things and then we'll get, we'll, there will be a moment where it all makes sense in a moment. Here's a document which is a list and a sequence of the images that appear in the book from Los Angeles departments. And it says rough. Okay, so that should mean rough draft of some sort. But it is exactly how the book is laid out. So it, there, is, there were no changes. Um, and you can see here there's a little number circled after each apartment. And that corresponds to, if it has a one, that means it's printed full frame. If it has a half, it's cropped. If it says long, it's across the gutter. If it says small, there's only two of those, it's small. And that is exactly on the rough draft um, as it appears. And so I think. Part of what you're able to do very often is that notion of premeditation, sort of planning ahead. And in fact, that comes out, you, you wrote a foreword a couple of years ago for a book on sign painting, and that's where that sign painting photograph comes. And you make this sort of joke about plan ahead, and clearly yeah, this person did not. Yeah, that's what all sign painters know about. Right. Plan ahead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And that seems to be the way that, in a, in a lot of ways, you've been able to get so much done because you let it sort of simmer in your head until it's ready and it's sort of done, even if it's not on paper. Um, and you're always thinking about the future. And I want to talk about that in a little bit of a different way because um, very recently you told an interviewer at the New York Public Library and an event very much like this that even in 1962 when you were making the photographs for 26 gasoline stations, you knew then that someday these photographs would have a layer of nostalgia applied to them that they didn't have in 1962, but you knew that that would have to be something you'd have to contend with, and it was a little bit unsettling for you. You really didn't want that sort of layer of sweetness applied there. And I'm wondering if you can say more about that and what happens to your work when nostalgia is inevitable, um, and how that also is part of any decision you might make when maybe decades later you might produce a portfolio with some of those same images? Are you sort of relinquishing the rights? I mean, are you, are you giving in to nostalgia? Is it part of it? How does that work for you? Um, I think when these uh, pictures were taken, I felt like um, this is, was immediate, and it was very up-to-date, and uh, all these things were contemporary subjects uh, with not much age involved. And, uh, but it did occur to me that with the change of time and styles and everything, the cycles that go, we go through in decades and periods, that uh, sooner or later these things would be looked upon as deep curiosities. You know, it's like if you could look at a gas station that was 1920, you would have a chuckle because of its age and its nostalgic connection. And um, I never really liked that idea that you would be able to lose where something has to, that's immediate and new has to go through cycles and get to a point where it looks nostalgic. Mm -hmm. Well, and when you've produced later portfolios of this work, if you look at this, everyone look at the little line at the top. Again, if you go back to your car, there it is. That's mm -hmm. what appears, that little window that, that flips out. 
So in many ways, there's a nostalgia around the gas station and of uh, a certain America that's past, but also there, there, I wonder if there's any sort of layer of nostalgia of your memories of 1962 and, and making photographs like that. It becomes also a lot about you and, and not so much about the gas station for, for some. Um, which leads me to my last question for you, which is, if you were thinking in 1962 about how these photographs would be viewed in the future, as you were putting all of these documents in folders, were you thinking about an archive in the future and if those materials would be uh, viewed and how they might be? No, no. Uh, <laughs> um, as, as I produced these things, uh, years would pass and I knew I had a backlog um, a sort of catalog of things that I had done. I didn't know where that was going to go or I didn't picture it as having any true value. So I just, but being the pack rat that I am, I stuck with it and, um, and then all these things just became part of that archive. Well, I'm so glad you were a pack rat. I invite all of you to come see the exhibition tomorrow or um, any time after that and to come and do research because the exhibition over there is really just a very small fraction of what else uh, is there in the papers. So very much. And I'm so grateful for you. Are you going to say something I was going to say something and uh, here's an extension of, of that uh, is that I always liked uh, movies that had scratches on the film mm -hmm. and these little blips and, and discolorations and all that and I began putting those things into my work and with the idea knowing that future generations are going to look at that and say we don't know what that means because there's no such thing as scratches on any film as a matter of fact there's no more film right. so right. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm almost illustrating nostalgia I don't know <laughs> it's complicated. That's, I wanted to end on it's that. It's complex. It is. It's very complex. <laughs> to learn more, see the exhibition across the way. <laughs> There's a whole uh, project called the Sunset Strip with six photographs uh, that originated in, in a book from 66, but come back later with scratches like this with the aw awareness that this uh, way of viewing um, analog film is not going to be familiar. Um, but you can become familiar with it if you go to the exhibition. And I want to thank you for um, all of your collaboration for being here tonight. It's been a real treat. Thank you, thank Jessica. You. Thank you. Okay.